Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Montauk, the president of Oleon Club, and on behalf of all our membership, I want to invite you invite you to enjoy two outstanding lectures. It's the custom of Amias to host lectures on pressing topics delivered by outstanding scholars in their field. And today we're especially privileged to have two. Is Jennifer Chase. Jennifer Chase was a member, twice in fact, of the School of Mathematics. She took her degree as well from Wilkinson University, so she's well familiar with Princeton and its intellectual topography. She's moved into, as we can see here, the position of managing director at Microsoft Research in New England, as well as in New York City. Her field is a rich and varied one. She deals with data of a very large scale, but perhaps even more compellingly, she deals, deals with networking data. And this type of networking is something with which she's quite familiar, not only professionally, but in terms of between academics and industry and research. And it's that type of rich networking that Amias, through its support, and commitment to the principles of the Institute for Advanced Study seeks to promote. So with that, I invite Jennifer Chase to come to the podium and to address us today. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm getting over uh, uh, laryngitis, so hopefully my voice will last for the 50 minutes or so that I have. Um, I would like to thank you for having me here. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. There are a lot of dear friends here who may have seen parts of this talk over the years, so please forgive me if you've seen parts of it. Okay, so the age of networks. There are many, many networks in our lives these days, or at least in some of our lives. There's the internet, the World Wide Web, there are online and offline social networks, but there are also uh, uh, biological networks like gene regulatory networks. And in general, from a mathematical point of view, there are many uh, uh, resource allocation networks, many problems that can be, um, can be written in terms of networks. Okay, so I will first tell you what some of the networks are that we see and would like to try to model and say something about. Then I will tell you um, what are some classes of problems on those networks. And then I'll focus on a couple of problems and go into them in, in some depth. Okay, so um, the observed networks that I'd like to talk about are technological networks, social networks, economic networks, and uh, uh, biological networks. And it may seem like they don't have much in common, but in fact, there are some common elements of them, and there are common elements of the math that we use to look at them and to get, uh, uh, get some information from them. So we model these networks as graphs, or at least the mathematicians model these networks as graphs. Um, so there are uh, vertices and there are edges of the graphs. So for example, the, um, uh, the internet has, uh, has autonomous systems, which are systems that can kind of be walled off if necessary. IAS.edu is an autonomous system. AOL is an autonomous system. MSN is autonomous. And the edges are the, uh, uh, the connections. The World Wide Web is uh, um, a directed graph. So the vertices are web pages and the edges are the hyperlinks that go from one web page to, uh, to another web page. There are many other networks that we could think about. There are things like um, cloud computing, uh, data center networks. These are really, um, really important networks for us to think about. You, you may not realize this, but you know, you, you may think it's kind of free when you do a search. But in fact, um, something like three to five percent of the power in this country 
is consumed by cloud computing networks. So when you do a search, it's not really free, okay? And, um, and we anticipate that that number will uh, double, uh, double every five years for a while. <laughs> Can't double that many times. Uh, but hopefully, if we come up with better ways of dealing with these networks, with, uh, with better algorithms on these networks, that number will not double quite as fast. Okay, social networks. So there are offline networks that people have studied for years and years. There are also online networks, you know, social networks like Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, there are wonderful questions that one can ask about clustering on these networks, um, about how to lay out these networks, about how to find, um, um, how to find uh, overlapping, um, overlapping communities on the networks. There are other networks that people have studied, mobile phone networks, um, instant messaging networks, uh, Twitter, which is a microblogging network, which we've actually studied the structure of. Um, there are also all kinds of uh, privacy issues <laughs> here. Um, there are more privacy issues than we realized six months ago. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but even before those, there were serious privacy issues. So can we come up with theories of privacy which allow us to say how much, um, uh, how much information can be extracted and cannot be extracted from these networks? Okay, uh, economic networks. So the, um, um, the, AS, uh, the, um, the AS internet, which I told you about, actually has three different levels. And it turns out that if you are on the top level, you don't have to pay to have your data transmitted to some other part of the network. If you're on the second level and you travel through the first level, you need to pay. And if you're on the third level, you travel through the second level or the first level, you need to pay. And so if you look at the routing on, on, um, on the AS intranet, it turns out to look bizarre until you realize the financial, um, uh, the financial incentives for the different kinds of routing. Okay, and there are a lot of people who study that. Then there are just graphs of buyers and sellers, um, and a lot of economists study graphs of buyers and sellers. You can insert some, uh, uh, some um, intermediaries into the graphs of buyers and sellers, and you can study things like auctions and all kinds of things on these networks. Okay, then there are biological networks. So uh, uh, phylogenetic trees, people have studied these for many, many years, okay? You look at what's at the leaves and you ask what might have, what might have caused that to be there. There are gene regulatory networks, which I'll talk, um, talk more about, which a priori you might not expect to look anything like any of these other networks, but in certain respects, they're like them. And then something that people have been talking a lot about recently are real, uh, uh, real neural networks. So there are big um, projects uh, for the brain to study the brain. In, in Europe, uh, 3 billion euros has been allocated to study the brain. And in the US, the president, um, a little less than a year ago, said he wanted to give $3 billion for uh, a US uh, 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 neuroscientists to study the brain. And there are all kinds of networking questions there that one can ask and, um, and then I'm sure people will be asking. Okay, so those are the networks that we would like to look at. It's a huge class of networks. Um, so what I would like to do now is tell you what some of the um, problems are that we would like to study on those networks. How can I come to those networks as a mathematician or a theoretical computer scientist and um, look at some problems on those networks. So one thing I might want to do, especially you know, if I'm a physicist, the first thing I would want to do is model the network. I'd want a simple model of the network from which I could um, say something. I might want a sample from very large networks, okay? Um, 
I might want to take a network and then look at a process on that network, usually a random process on that network. I might want to come up with a way to calculate something on one of these networks, or I might want to look at a network or part of a network and um, ask, what is, what is the rest of the network likely look like? So in the phylogenetic case, I look at the leaves and I say, can, from that, can I conclude anything about you know, where, where we came from? So these are different classes of problems, but you can bring graph theory and combinatorics and probability theory to bear on all of these questions. And of course, at the IAS, people do this all the time. So uh, uh, observations of technical and social networks. So if I'm going to model a network, first thing I have to do is ask, what features do I want to model? Okay, I'm not going to model everything because otherwise I can't say anything about it from a mathematical point of view. So what are the features that I would like to capture? Well, the first is that most of the networks I'm talking about have a small diameter. Anywhere you are on the network, it's likely that you can hop to another place on the network, to, to, to some other given place on the network in not too many steps. Um, the first person most people uh, say talked about this was um, an author in 1929 um, in a short story in which he, um, he said that everybody on earth is connected to everybody else by at most six steps, which was really prescient. I mean, I have no idea how, how a Hungarian author came up with this, I mean, in, you know, in 1929. Uh, Stanley Milgram, uh, a few decades later, um, had an experiment, which I'm sure a lot of you know, in which he, um, he gave a postcard to a person in one part of the country and said, you know, I want you to send this to, let's say, an elementary school teacher in another part of the country. So in the Midwest saying, I want to send you, you to send this to an elementary school teacher in, in New England, okay? And so you have to come up locally, so this is a local algorithm, with what you think is going to be your fastest way through the shortest number of hops to get that postcard to the person. And when Milgram did this, he found out it was six degrees of separation. There was um, an experiment on Facebook about, uh, a year ago, um, in which they found out that everybody on Facebook is connected by at most about five hops, okay? So, I mean, obviously, we're taking out the disconnected components of, you know, the person who signs up for Facebook and then never, never attaches to anybody else, which some of you may be in that boat. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing that we would like the networks that we model to have is when I ask, um, what are the odds that I have k neighbors, okay? Um, how, how quickly does that fall off with, with k? Well, you know, the odds that I have a billion neighbors, that's probably not, you know, a billion connections, that's not very big, but is it falling off exponentially in a billion? Is it falling off like a power law in a billion? Well, it turns out on most of these networks that have some kind of human interaction in them, it falls off like a power law in k. So the probability that I um, have k neighbors falls off like k to, one over k to some power. Okay, then there are other things on some of the um, technological networks at, at least, which is that um, older vertices tend to be more highly connected, okay? So older vertices have formed, um, have formed connections over time on the internet or the World Wide Web, and so just, you know, on average, they tend to have more, more neighbors. Um, and a lot of businesses try to use this by buying up, um, buying up old names, um, old domain names, and saying, okay, I'm going to use these to try to create extra connections and raise somebody up in the ranking in a, in a web engine, in a, in a search engine. So in case you don't know how search engines work, um, Okay, what's going on here? Um, okay, so um, search engines and graph theory. Okay, so the early search engines, um, 
used, uh, uh, used semantics to, um, somebody's phone is going off, to find the, um, the most relevant web pages. Okay, so they actually scoured the words on the page and used that to try to find the, the, the most relevant web pages. Later search engines used the structure of the web graph. They used graph theory and simple, um, uh, simple algorithms over time, um, more and more complex, um, more and more complex algorithms to find the most relevant web pages. So how do, how do you do this? I'm sure that a lot of you know this, but in case you, you don't, the lowest order term in something like Google is something called page rank, which is that I'm gonna treat the as I have said before, the web is a graph, as a directed graph on the hyperlinks, and I'm just gonna take a walk along these hyperlinks. So I'm gonna walk from my web page to Christian's web page, to Jurg's web page, to so on and so on, okay? And, um, and, and, I'm, and just in case I get stuck someplace, because let's say I go from my web page to a paper on my web page which has no outlinks well, then I'm gonna get stuck, okay? So I don't want that, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, let's say every seventh step on average, or I flip a weighted coin with probability one seventh, I'm gonna jump to a uniformly random site someplace else, okay? And then I keep on going, and the fact that I jump, you know, on average every seventh step means I'm not gonna get stuck, okay? And eventually things are gonna settle down if I do this. It's gonna take a long time if you have a trillion sites, but eventually things are gonna settle down and I'm going to find that Christian's web page has, is, um, Christian's web page is visited more than my web page. He has a higher rank and your rank in that stationary distribution is your page rank. So that is, that's what Larry Page and Sergey Brin did as grad students, okay? And that is the beginning of the graph theoretic kinds of search engines. Now what happens, of course, is that since it's a big business, people try to spam it now. The way they spam it is they create extra connections to old domains and old pages that raise up the ranking and... Well, okay, That's, yes, he paid somebody to do that, okay. And, um, and so then there are all kinds of lawsuits because then Google pulls the... Um, uh, pulls that site out because they say you've unfairly raised yourself up and then the site goes to court and says you destroyed my business and da da da, da. So there is, um, uh, there's an easier way to do it which is that you can just, rather than going to court, um, you can just go to a mathematician and you can come up with a ranking algorithm that will detect and avoid anomalies as you're going along and just downgrade those web pages that have anomalies. Okay, that have anomalous neighborhoods. You don't throw them out, you just downgrade them as you're doing your walk and it all takes care of itself and then you don't have to go to lawyers. Okay, so modeling networks. So the first model that people came up with was the, uh, 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 the Barabashi, um, Barabashi Albert model. So at each time step, it's like a rich gets richer model or a more popular model. You know, I walk into a room and I say, oh, you know, that, that person has, seems to have three friends and that person has seven friends and that person has two friends. So I'm gonna attach to them with a probability which depends on how many friends they, they have already, okay? And so that's the preferential attachment model. Um, and uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first rigorous work on that was done around the year 2000 by Bela Bolabash who, who was actually a visitor here, I'm pushing this in the wrong direction, this is not smart. Okay, there we go. Um, so, other types of models. Well, other variants of preferential attachment are things like preferential attachment with fitness. Just because, you know, um, my website is older than your website, maybe you have a really attractive website, so people will link to that more often. When you look at that, you get really beautiful mathematics, which turns out to look just like a Bose-Einstein condensation. You get all this very pretty stuff for people who know Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, there are competition models. So 
in, in which you say, oh, what I'm going to do is not just link preferentially, but when I come in, I'm going to try to optimize some function. Uh, I'm going to attach to the site which optimizes some function for me, okay? And so I, I, I do that and I build some interesting network. And then you can take that even further and you can do something called a game theoretic model. Jesus, sorry guys. Um, a fully game theoretic model in which you have um, agents who are interacting with each other and keep on interacting with each other in a game theoretic way to come up with a model. So there are all kinds of ways in which people do these models. Okay, so we've got tons and tons of models. What are the other things that we'd like to do besides just model a network? Well, one thing that we'd like to do is sample from these networks. Why do we want to sample? We want to sample because the networks are huge, okay? So we can't calculate everything. We, we can't take in the whole network and calculate something on it. So for example, the World Wide Web is over a trillion static sites. How do we sample from it if we want to calculate this page rank where we take this random walk? How do we do that? Well, there's this theory of graph limits and testing that, um, that we developed over the years. And actually, there, there was a, a semester here about a year ago in which a lot of people were working on this. And basically, um, we took a cue from physics and we said, instead of looking at you know, the, 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 the graph at any given time, we're, we're going to ask, does it have certain properties in the limit? And of course, you could come up with different notions of a limit if you come up with a notion that's really strong, then everything looks different in the limit. If you come up with a notion that's really weak, then everything looks the same in the limit. Um, and so you've got you've to be intelligent about it. And we came up with, first for dense graphs in this whole series of papers, um, notions, about six different notions based on various things in mathematics, all of which turned out to give the same notion of what the limit was. So that makes a mathematician feel good when you have a priori different things that lead to the same thing. Um, still, and, and then we did sparse graphs, but still we weren't getting these things like the World Wide Web. And just very, very recently with um, an amazing grad student, Yufei Zhao, um, we're getting um, graph limits for sparse graphs with power law tails, which really look like the World Wide Web. So um, Yufei will be going on the job market probably in a year or two, and he's really good. Um, okay. So uh, processes on networks. So this is another kind of problem you can look at. You can say, um, okay, so I've got this network. It was formed by preferential attachment or by something else, okay? How do I describe things I care about in the world on this network? Well, what are things we care about? How about flow of information on networks, okay? A lot of people ask on Twitter, how does information flow? over different kinds of networks. How do you get information uh, uh, transmitted over those networks? John Kleinberg and a lot of other people have looked at this and there are really, really nice ways of, of doing this. Um, a, another thing that um, you might wanna do is you might wanna say, I've got this network which looks kinda random. How does an epidemic spread on the network, okay? So you could come up with a really simple model which is the one that we looked at um, in which you could, with some probability, spread the disease to a neighboring site, okay? And see, how does it behave? And if the network has di a different structure, it'll behave very, very differently. If the network looks like a grid, you know, it's not, it's a kind of a typical phase transition that people were used to 30 years ago when I was in graduate school, okay? Um, more, but, but for something like a preferential attachment network, um, epidemics, if, if you have a positive probability of transmission, no matter how small an epidemic takes off. Okay, so the phase transition is basically at zero, which is why you worry so much about these worldwide SARS types, um, SARS types of epidemics. 
Then there are viral marketing questions. If I'm on a network and um, I want to spread something on the network, I want to give something to a few people on the network, to a seed set such that it would spread maximally, or such that in expectation it would spread maximally, what seed set would I choose? Okay, people are looking at these kinds of questions. So these, but these are processes on networks, the viral marketing process or the epidemic spread process or the flow of information. Okay, the next thing is algorithms on networks. And here's where, interestingly, you know, like every algorithm kind of gives rise to high tech companies, okay? So ranking algorithm. Well, there was the original page rank algorithm. We've recently been doing, um, this is more kind of like math than companies, but we've been trying to do sublinear time algorithms, okay? When you have really large networks, um, there are interesting uh, uh, combinatorial and probabilistic questions. How do you try to do something like page rank without even reading in the whole network, okay? So, um, uh, Noga's here someplace, and I think he's worked on sublinear time things, okay? There are, there are interesting questions that come up there. Okay, then there are things like clustering algorithms for collaborative filtering on bipartite graphs. So, you know, Amazon tells you, if you like this, you'll also like that. Or Netflix, you know, the reason many of us join Netflix is because it suggests movies to us that we actually like, that we never would have found, especially if we have ob obscure tastes in, in movies. Okay, how does it do that? Actually, it does that with something that is a beautiful mathematical problem, the sparse graph problem. You have people on, you know, you have a matrix, and you have people here, and you have movies here, and how many movies do I rate out of all possible movies? Not too many of them, so it's a sparse graph, right? I don't, I don't put, you know, or sparse matrix. I don't put too many ratings in there, and so how from this relatively unpopulated matrix do I generate predictions for how you're gonna feel about all of these movies? And it's really, really beautiful. I mean, a lot of people started thinking about the Netflix challenge a few years ago when they proposed a million dollars to, to, improve, um, to, improve their, um, to improve their algorithm and Candace worked on it, it led to some of the Candace and Tao stuff. There's really lovely, lovely mathematics there. And there are also big companies there. Okay, um, algorithms for multicasting. So we've done algorithms for multicasting. And similar things are used for web hosting. So um, this, was, this was a company that came out of um, MIT Math. Okay, um, so you, you ask, uh, if I have a network um, and I want to be able to access information well on the network, even when a lot of people are trying to access it, where should I mirror the, the information? Where should I reproduce it, okay, so that most people will be able to access it when they need it, even when a lot of people are trying, and those are some, I mean, those were like some Fox and Stock papers that, and those algorithms led to Akamai, which is the biggest web, web hosting company. Okay, then um, this viral marketing question here. Um, we've recently been working on, on again, these sublinear time um, algorithms for trying to find, you know, without even looking at everything, how can we figure out what are likely to be just just approximate values of the most influential seed sites. And then um, uh, an algorithm for a, a, a recommendation system. So if I took your Facebook network or some other network and I tried to generate from that personalized recommendations for you, how would I do that best? Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a little while. Okay, and finally, the last class of problems that I want to mention as a general class is the, uh, uh, the, network, um, the network reconstruction um, algorithms. So as I said, this is where you look at the leaves of the tree and you ask what is most likely to have produced what I can see now, which is just the leaves. I mean, the leaves are a big part of a tree, 
Okay, they're a big percentage of a tree. But so, where did it come from? And there are lots of people who look at this question. Um, then there are gene, um, uh, gene regulatory networks. So I look at, you know, what protein seems to be present with some other protein around, and I ask, well, you know, what, what gene network is likely to, to have given rise to that? Or um, uh, uh, in, um, um, in neuroscience, I could ask, um, how do I reconstruct a learning process? I could look at a, um, at a nematode, and I know it has about 400 neurons, and I put it in different environments, and I see how it reacts, and I'm doing a combinatorial optimization problem to map backwards and try to see what series of neurons led to that learning process, okay? So these are really nice combinatorial optimization problems, all of them, because you're looking at something at the end and you're trying to figure out what is the most likely path that gave rise to that. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the gene regulatory networks also. So now a couple of specific problems. So uh, recommendation systems on trust networks and reconstruction of gene regulatory networks. Okay, so from a social network, I can build a trust network. And so what is this? It's, uh, so, so I don't want to go to Facebook, which has your um, academic network and your family network and the high school people who found you that you can't believe they found you and there they are and they're all superimposed, okay? I want to kind of disentangle these a little bit. And I'm going to ask you, you know, point to the people whose recommendations you think you might trust for restaurants, okay? Point to the people whose recommendations you might trust in a different domain, you know, for um, a math reference, and these are probably, or they may be different groups, okay? So for each domain, I have a trust network, which are these, these arrows of people you trust, and I'm now going to assume that each, um, each uh, node is in one of three states. So each person on the network either you know, um, likes the restaurant, doesn't like the restaurant, or has no opinion. And what I want to do is I want to propagate the opinions throughout the graph until everybody, un until I, I can give some possible opinion to everybody based on the opinions of the people they trust and the people that they trust and the people that they trust. Okay, so an axiomatic approach. You see, if I, I mean, there are lots of ways I could do that. I could take the majority. And that wouldn't be making use of the network structure, but I could say, so how do I sort out all these different ways that I might be able to, to do that? So what I'm going to ask instead is I'm, I'm going to be um, um, arrow-esque, social choice-ish, and I'm going to say what properties do I want my recommendation system to satisfy, okay? So I might want it to have symmetry. I might want to say, okay, if I change all the people who like the restaurant to dislike and all the dislikes to likes, then the answer should flip, okay? And I should say it doesn't matter what somebody's name is, provided that they're in the same position, that they have the same neighborhood, it, 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 it shouldn't matter, okay? And there are other things, there are things that sound a lot like arrow, independence of irrelevant. So you write down a set of axioms that any reasonable person would say it should obey. And, um, and you know, people think that the cool thing about about arrow is impossibility. In social choice, it's so easy to get impossibility. All you do is that you add enough axioms that nothing could ever satisfy it, okay? So our first theorem, you know, okay, so we added enough axioms and nothing could satisfy it. So actually, positive results, I think, are much more interesting in social choice than negative results, even though people love impossibility theorems for some reason. Okay. So we also had positive results. We said with those six axioms, we could remove any one of them, take the other five, and we actually explicitly constructed an algorithm which obeyed the other five, which had the other five properties. Okay, some looked a little bit like that page, page rank thing with a random walk, an iterated majority, min cut, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and we may even be able to use these algorithms to monetize social networks. We've talked to people about using them, you know, to give, to actually give recommendations to, to people. Okay, um, now I'll talk more on um, the reconstruction of gene regulatory networks. Really different, different problem. <laughs> okay, 
So the standard dogma, DNA gets transcribed to RNA, gets transcribed to proteins. And, you know, there's epigenetics. And I mean, just don't, don't worry about all the other stuff, okay? So what, what happens then is that the proteins go and they sit on the DNA and they enhance the transcription of some parts of it and they inhibit the transcription of other parts of it. So you have a feedback network. Okay, and this leads to a gene regulatory network. All this stuff is going on in the cell, and this is why, you know, you have the same DNA in every cell, and, oh, but the cells do different things because there's a feedback process. Okay, so there's a protein interactome. So problems with the gene regulatory network are, of course, the source of, um, um, of many human diseases. So one question we can ask is how do we infer the network structure from partial data. We don't know everything that's going on, we just know a little bit. What's the network most likely to have produced the little bit that we can see? Another thing that is really interesting is can we identify nodes on this network which may be responsible for the dysregulation in a particular disease? Because if we can, those are drug targets, okay? Or one or more of them might be drug targets. And I'm really oversimplifying. So the systems biologists in the audience, like, don't, don't start having heart. It's just very schematic and simplified. Okay, so there are all these kinds of measurements that one can make. You do computational models, and you come up with points of intervention. Okay, so gene expression data. So microarray chips will tell us which gene is expressed in the presence of which other gene under a certain set of conditions. So you, you know, change the pro protein A and protein B seem to be positively correlated in this condition. And so you're taking all these different snapshots under different sets of conditions. And I can ask, you know, um, is some protein being expressed or some gene being expressed higher or lower than its background rate? Is it differentially expressed? Because if it's differentially expressed, maybe there's something interesting going on there, okay? So from that, I'm gonna infer a node weight. I'm gonna make the proteins my nodes, and I'm gonna infer a node weight. If it's under or overexpressed, it's gonna get more of a weight. And to get edge weights in my network, what I'm gonna say is, let me look over everything I know about this organism. Does protein A interact with protein B directly, or is it believed to interact directly with protein B under, under you know, in all the experiments that people have done on, on this organism, okay? And that's how I'm gonna get my, my edge weights, okay? And then how do we determine the network most likely to have produced the data? So, a little bit of math. Um, I've got a graph, and I've got edge costs, which have to do with how much some place in the database on this, on this organism, um, A and B have interacted with each other. But the, the, the general Steiner tree problem, I've just got edge weights, and I've got some, some nodes that I say, I want them to appear in my final network. Not everything has to appear in the final network. What I want to do is I want to find a particular kind of network, a tree, no, no loops, which contains all the nodes I've specified. So of the thousand possible nodes, these 17 of them have to be in there, okay? And I don't care about the rest, okay? And I have certain edge weights. And what I want to do is I want to minimize this cost. So I want to connect those 17, but I might have to put in extra ones because there might not be a direct path, okay? And the additional nodes that land up being in the minimizing solution are called Steiner nodes, after this guy Steiner. And those are ones that I didn't specify in advance have to be in there, but they turn up in there anyway. Okay. And we found a number of years ago a representation of the problem in terms of a certain class algorithms that were actually inspired by statistical physics that seemed to, seems to work very well. Okay, so the biological problem called the prize collecting Steiner tree. So here, instead of saying these 17 out of the 1,000 must appear there, I'm gonna say, oh, I'm gonna make those 17 have prizes. And may maybe I want like node number three. It, I really want it to be there, so I'm gonna give it a huge prize. You know, node number 11, a smaller prize, but whatever. 
okay? And, um, and then what I want to do is I want to do something like I did before, but I want to have these prizes in there. And if you look at this, what lands up happening is that as this parameter lambda goes to infinity, then, oh my God, I better have everything with a positive prize in there. So that goes back to the old Steiner tree problem. Then uh, any one of, so 17 of them had positive prizes, and as lambda goes to infinity, they, they better be in there, okay? Um, but if lambda's not infinity, hey, maybe I want to leave one of them out because uh, the, the cost isn't so big, okay? Mapping to the biological data. So I want to find the tree which minimizes this. Um, the CIJs are going to come from what I know about whether this protein is connected to that protein, okay? Um, and, the, um, and these prizes are going to have to do with if a particular um, gene is under or overexpressed, okay? If it's not sitting at its background value. I don't care if it's too much or too little. If it's not at its background value, hey, that's interesting. Maybe something's going on with that one. So I give it a prize. And how much or how little it's under or overexpressed will determine the size of the prize. Okay, so Steiner nodes. Steiner nodes are those nodes that don't have to be in the solution, but you use them to connect the other nodes. So, so let's, let's just look at this case, okay? Here, these things are the, are the edges, and I actually don't want heavy edges now. Heavy edges are the ones that, oh, that, that interaction probably doesn't exist. I want a tree which connects these, and the size of them has to do with the weights. Now, what's going to happen is that um, this guy here, he doesn't have a very big weight, but, wow, if I put him in there, then I get these two, which have pretty big weights. So they're pretty juicy, okay? So I'm going to want those in, in the solution. And why is this interesting from a biological point of view? Well, from a biological point of view, it may be that this is a protein which has a small weight. It's not really very much underexpressed or overexpressed. I wouldn't have guessed it has anything to do with this disease or with this effect. But here it is popping up. So maybe that's a protein that I should be paying some attention to that sitting at its background value is doing something very interesting, the process that's controlling this mechanism or controlling this disease, okay? So this thing, which is this mathematical thing, these Steiner nodes turn out biologically to have an interpretation like that. So we did this with the yeast pheromone response pathway. This is the first thing that we worked on. We went and we got known data on this. There were 56 different, um, different realizations of this. For each one, we constructed a tree, we superimposed the trees, um, and, and, um, and we merged the solutions to get one network. So here's how the network looked. There are two kinds of proteins that showed up on the final network. There were the proteins which had a large prize in the thing I was trying to optimize. Hell, I'm not surprised they showed up. They had a large prize. I was trying to optimize that, okay? But then there were the proteins that were not differentially expressed very much, therefore didn't have a big prize, which showed up anyway, like that one, okay? That one didn't have a large prize. It showed up anyway. So is that important in the pathway, in the yeast pheromone pathway, okay? So... Then what we had to do is we had to run around and we were just mathematicians and physicists and get a biologist to actually do an experiment, never having before predicted anything. Um, so that was hard. Um, we, found, we finally found some very nice people in France who were willing to do that. So they did an experiment to knock out the gene corresponding to that and the pheromone response pathway failed. Okay, so that was experimental proof. I'm used to mathematical proofs. This was experimental proof that this thing which people had not thought had anything to do with that pathway, in fact, did. What, why did it come out? It came out because it was in a solution to a combinatorial optimization problem. So that optimization problem was telling me, ooh, this, this probably has something to do with this pathway, even though it's just sitting at its background level, okay? But who cares about yeast, okay? We care about mammals. Mammals have much more incomplete data. They have 10 times as many transcription factors. They have huge intergenetic regions, so we need much faster algorithms, okay? We had a fast algorithm, okay? So we looked at glioblastoma, which is um, a really terrible form of cancer. Um, 
It's a particular form of brain cancer. It's what Ted Kennedy had. Um, it's the human cancer with the worst outcome. Uh, about four times as many men get it as, as women. Um, and, you know, if you do everything, if you do, you know, uh, surgery and chemo and radiation, you live about a year. It's just awful, okay? Um, so can we find the pathways using this prize collecting Steiner tree? Okay, how do we choose the root? Well, you think, how do, how do signaling mechanisms happen? Well, maybe they happen with like proteins that sit in the membrane, okay? Um, so there's one that we decided to choose as the root of our Steiner tree. It's known to be messed up in a lot of human cancer, so we chose that as our root. Here's the resulting pathway. Um, and if you're a biologist, which I'm not, you go, oh, this makes a whole lot of sense. There are all these things that I know about that have to do with cancer on this pathway, okay? Some of which were probably discovered by people here, okay? But what is this one? This one's really big. So the size has to do with how central it is in the pathway, and the color has to do with its prize to begin with. So here's one that didn't have a prize, but it, it was very, very central in the pathway. Okay. So the top five nodes ranked by a certain kind of centrality are these. The first one is pretty well known to be involved in lots of cancers. We give it a big prize. What about this one that I had pointed out to you? Well, what is it? Okay, it's not a prize, wasn't previously identified. What is it? It's the estrogen receptor. So it's the first pathway link between glioblastoma and gender, okay? Which just popped out of a solution to a combinatorial optimization problem. Experimental test, you add the EGFR inhibitor and estradiol, which is estrogen basically, in culture, and it seems to, um, it seems to inhibit the growth. Now, how the hell you get estrogen into the brain, you know? <laughs> it's not clear, so drug ther therapy, who knows? But anyway, it's an interesting discovery. So now, in the last five minutes or so, we've, we've been doing multiple signaling pathways because there are multiple signaling pathways that take place that are involved in certain diseases. They're not just one big tree. There are multiple things happening in parallel that in concert seem to cause a certain disease or seem to be present in a certain disease. So here we use a prize collecting Steiner forest instead of a tree. So we have many trees in a forest. We have K disjoint trees, let's say, and just a picture of it. We add an artificial node. So this is something that, you know, I remember people doing back in mathematical physics in the, in the 70s and 80s. You add this artificial node, you know, when you have like a magnetic field or something, you, you attach everything to it. Okay. And then what happens is you can see the separate things coming out from this artificial node. Okay, so what it does is it reveals parallel working pathways, and it also still reveals these previously unidentified proteins. Okay, we did this for the yeast pheromone network, and it really made a lot of sense. We got these separate, um, separate things, which, which were known to, to be associated with certain functions. We did it for glioblastoma, and we again got things which were known to be associated with certain functions. Then we said, okay, what we really care about, the promise of um, a lot of this science is personalized medicine, okay? So on the one hand, you want to understand pathways for a whole disease. On the other hand, you want to understand what's going on with a particular patient, especially since the way certain cancers manifest themselves are quite different in different patients, okay? So very recently, um, with a wonderful postdoc, um, uh, Tony Gitter, we looked at uh, an extension to prize collecting Steiner forests on many different patients. So we looked at the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a wonderful source of data. I'm sure a lot of people here are working on it. We looked at breast cancer. We extracted shared features in all of the breast cancer forests, 
we learned the, the individual forest, we identified similar elements. We said, this is, these are probably the drivers of the cancer. But then we would add prizes to the shared nodes, go back and iterate, and come up with highly patient-specific networks, which nevertheless have input from the other patients. So this is one of the first mechanisms we've seen that we're getting both the drivers and things which are specific to, um, to the patients. And for example, one thing that we found was a subclass whose Steiner nodes, remember these are the extra nodes that you weren't expecting to be in it, but they just pop out of the combinatorial optimization problem, um, looked like they were talking about a, a certain um, pathway and what it indicated is that this certain class might actually be treatable with drugs which are used in another kind of cancer. So we saw something popping out that you normally see in this gastrointestinal tumors that you don't normally see in breast cancer, but wow, they were very, very uh, 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 significant Steiner nodes, but only for a subclass of patients. So, um, and that's something that uh, Tony will be presenting um, in January. So, the summary. Everywhere we look, we see large-scale networks. Okay, technological, social, um, economic, biological. It's really nice because um, we can bring math. <laughs> we love to study these networks. We can bring graph theory, combinatorics, probability, game theory, algorithm. The results include new theories, new theorems, new experimental predictions new business models maybe, which makes Microsoft happy, um, and then maybe more than that, possibly new personalized drugs.